Welcome back to Switch to Linux. It is Friday and another news night. We're going to be having a look at just a couple of news about business and corporatocracy today. So we're going to go ahead and uh, dive on into a few little articles. This was a fascinating little one. Comcast won't give new speed boost to internet users who don't buy TV services. Comcast, let's get this through your head. People don't want to pay for your stupid TV. I know, they're all concerned about cord cutters and cord nevers and all this internet takeover of the world, but can somebody please explain to me like I'm a five-year-old, why if I buy two services from you, it costs less than if I buy one service from you? You would think it would actually cost a little bit less to just buy one because I don't want your crappy cable box. I don't want any of that kind of stuff. Next time I have to have a discussion with these guys, I might just tell them, fine, I will go ahead and buy your dual package. But don't send me the cable box because I ain't hooking it up and I'm certainly not paying a monthly rental fee for your cable box. So I can do that. You can give me the cheaper rate. Do those. Just don't send me that crap. If you try and send it to me that crap, I'm going to refuse it. If you leave it on my front door and it's refused, guess what? According to federal law, I own it now. You want it back? You're going to buy it back for me for about $5,000. Deal with it, punk. Oh boy. But anyway, um, basically what's going on here is, is in light of all of the net neutrality, blah, blah, blahs, you know, people are concerned about, about things. And so now they're saying, Hey, here's the speeds, but we're going to be able to boost you up on internet speeds and some things, but only, only if you happen to also subscribe to our cable TV. Now, why, why is this happening? Well, because insanity has ensued simply because they're concerned about losing profits from not having as many cable subscribers. So they're like, oh, our TV numbers are going down. And, and the, some of their funding comes from how much television subscribers that they have. So yeah, Comcast will not give speed boost to internet users who don't buy TV um, because they keep losing TV. And um, this is the new way to fight cord cutting. Regulators, would you guys stop accepting money from these morons and split them up? Split them up. They are a monopoly. I hate Comcast. Comcast can rot in hell as far as I'm concerned. And it is the only ISP I can get in my area. And I am in the metropolis area. All right? Comcast, break up. Regulators, stop taking their cash. I know we're in a corporatocracy and all, but stop taking their cash. Break them up so that we can actually have some market competition. And maybe we can get some decent internet speeds without selling off my children every week. For the love. Well, Amazon's got a new thing. Of course, they pushed out their Amazon uh, children's dot or whatever last week. So, hey, now we have a new smart speaker for your children because we need to get them addicted to crazy data collection, always listening microphone technology as early as we possibly can. So now for an extra $22.99 on top of your already rising prices for Prime, you can now get a, a box. I think this cost $22, like $22.99 I think is what it is. Oh, it could save you up to $35 off list price. Uh, 35%, excuse me, off list price. So basically what happens is every one, two, or three months, you get two hardcover books. You have to pick your age ranges, and then it's basically, it's just one of these, and this is the funny thing. This is the funny thing, is that um, they pick the possible books. You don't get to chip pick the books. It's basically like one of those uh, one of those surprise boxes where you order the surprise box. Why somebody would pay 15, 20, 30, 50 bucks a month to have a random box full of advertisers products in there is so far beyond my level of comprehension. It just tells me how crazy our society has gotten. Um, but basically you can't control what's in the box. You can't control what's in this box either. You just buy this thing. It costs $22 on top of your Prime for your children to get two hardcover books a month, uh, one, two, or three months, and you know, in those increments. But you can't pick what the book is. Well, you can say, I want this book and this book out of a list of books that they offer you. And so how does it work? Well, you pick your preferences. Tell us about your reader. Oh, now that we know you have a toddler in your house, we can now use that information to market you more crap. <laughs> Thank you, Amazon.
Uh, we curate the books. Um, all this talk about Amazon, by the way. If you shop at Amazon, use my link up there. That'll help support the channel. <laughs> Full disclosure and all. Um, we curate, you decide. We pick our favorites, and then you can preview and tailor the book list from their curated favorites. So you know their curated favorites actually is, um, as an author, um, now, when you are publishing a book with Am with Amazon or with, you know, like Kindle, so um, my books right now, uh, well, I'm moving my other book towards it. But anyway, my, my, my overarching goal is I use CreateSpace for the printing because it allows the best distribution and options for, for my books. All right. But then I use KDP to push the Kindle version so you can get on Amazon and buy the ebook version of my books. When you do that, um, when you do that, then... You have the option when you're publishing to say, you might know that Amazon has this, this book program where you can basically like rent a book. And when you rent the book, you know, some, you, can, you can download it and the author will be paid a little bit based upon the, how far somebody reads through your book, how long they have it on their, their device, whatever that happens to be. The problem is they strong arm you into that by saying if you want to get XYZ commission rate and or get that which means your book is going to be more promoted than books that are not in the program you have to agree to exclusively sell on Amazon and to DRM lock it I'm against DRM and on that basis I openly rejected it so Amazon doesn't recommend my book nearly as much as it recommend a book based on somebody that has opted for their strong-armed policies because I want to make sure that A, I'm not bound to only sell my book on Amazon, and B, I don't want to DRM lock my book, because if you buy my book, you own it, whether that's a digital copy or a print copy. And so that is kind of the, the, the issue with this. So that's my guess, is that the books that you're going to get are, they are either people are paying them to be included in this list, or they're books where people have given up rights to be in this list. That is what my guess is. You know, they're not going to be kind and just pick random publishers um, out of the kindness of their heart. Of course, everything's got to have a trendy video. Ooh, look at this perfect little family reading their wonderful little books. How happy they are to receiving their two new books. Ooh, the love of reading discovered. Um, and so that's kind of, I don't know, $22.99 per box. On top of your rising price of Amazon Prime. How, how exciting, Amazon. How exciting. This is one I actually did not read the article. I meant to read the article, and I added, added it to my list, and I forgot to go through and read the article. Uh, but anyway, um, the, remember the, this guy, this this guy here, uh, O'Reilly, Michael O'Reilly. Like his face is even more memeable than than Asia shut your pie hole. Um, well, end up that he broke the law by advocating for Trump. Guys, don't give him another chance. Boot him off. And disqualify all of his votes. Shocking. He broke the law. We know he broke the law. We know giving people too many choices happens to lead to things like Parkland shootings. Get him off of there. Don't give him another choice. Get him off of there. Get him out. Get him out. Go. Go. You're fired. Have Trump go in there. You're fired. Disqualifies votes because he broke the law. He is a regulator to make sure the position, the, the communication stays neutral, and he advocated for Trump. And this isn't an accusation. This is a finding. A finding. But apparently, you know, you can be in a high position of government power and break the law, and all you get is, don't do that again, Michael. <laughs> Thanks for my payment. <sighs> Read the article. I hope I'm right about all that. This is an interesting one. I like this one because um, the there's a there's a whole lot of these tech startup companies all across the world that are just trying to they're trying to have you know teams of you know three people four people actually working on the project and then hiring tons and tons hundreds thousands millions of people to actually do the work so this is a new court ruling in california that will affect uber lyft grubhub 
all of the other companies that are contracting people to go to the grocery stores, buy groceries, drop off, offer rides. All of these type of tech startups are all affected by this. And really, I'm glad to see this working because what ends up happening here is um, the there are laws about who is a contractor and who is an employer. Businesses really, 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 really want everyone to be classified as a contractor because there it is a lot cheaper to hire a contractor than it is to hire an employee. All right, so this is a huge problem in the academic world right now because progressively more and more up to 60 and even up to 70 and 80% of faculty at many universities now are adjunct. An adjunct faculty is a contractor, not an employee. The difference is, if you are unaware of how business works, as a small business owner, and this is one of the challenges I get, is that we as small business owners, we pay a ton more in taxes. So if you take your W-2 and you look at it, of course, in the United States, you look at your W-2 and you'll see the FICA on there. Uh, is it FICA? I think it's FICA. Uh, and that is your Social Security, um, you know, Social Security, Medicaid, all of those types of things, which are come out of your check and taxes but they're separate from your income tax an employee uh, an employer has to pay the employees half of that so an employee whatever you see on that line your employer also paid in that line when you are self-employed you're responsible for for that much so if you and I worked a very similar job at a very similar rate and received the same amount of money I am sending twice as much to the government for that tax as you are because you are contributing 50% of that and your employer is contributing 50% of that. Then of course, if you're a full-time employer, you need to furnish the insurance and things like that. And so with all of those situations going on, you can see that it's, it costs less money. So when I actually left teaching and there was a lot of things back and forth and frankly, uh, they actually, they actually broke the terms of, of our, leaving the position literally within a week of that. I could have sued them and won, uh, but I'm not that type of person. Um, they had signed the contracts and then they decided at the last minute they wanted to hire somebody else and leave me out of the position. To do that and not get thoroughly sued, they had to pay me out of the entire contract which meant not only did they have to pay me my salary, they also had to pay me the amount that they were pay, gonna pay into um, that extra tax. They were gonna pay me um, the entire amount of what the medical insurance was gonna cost. Everything from the wage, the institutional bonus, the insurance payout, and the tax payout, they had to pay me all up front all at once because they broke the contract with me. It was either that or get sued and probably lose um, in other cases too. And so what you saw in that is that while my payment was one level, it was the cost of an employee has to an employer is take your salary and multiply by 1.5. 1.5 to 2 is about what an employee actually costs. So the salary you have is not what your cost to the company is. And so companies want to hire people as independent contractors because they don't have to pay the W-2, they don't have to pay the insurance, they don't have to pay anything else, just the flat rate wage that they're offering. But the problem is, is too many companies are trying to class everybody as contractors and not as employees. And this is a ruling and opinion that came down and said, no, we actually are looking at this and saying, you have to hire all these people as employees, which means you have to make sure that they're making at least minimum wage. If they're working over, over 40 hours a week, you have to pay them time and a half. If they're uh, working more than 30 hours a week, you have to furnish insurance and you have to be paying their portion of W-2s. Um, or their, their portion of FICA. And so this is a huge, 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 in my opinion, win. Because this ruling will put better, more people out there or the company closes down. And okay, company closes down, we lose a business like Uber. You know what? That's probably okay. Because it just means that three corporate executives won't have millions and millions and millions while a bunch of people are scrounging to possibly get enough gas to drive people back and forth. And some people do very well on positions like Uber and Lyft, but the majority of them don't. 
And so when this ruling comes down, it basically says that, and, and, and all, in all honesty, these were always in place. All this did is looked at the IRS qualifications, and I believe, if I remember correctly, it's the S-9 form. The S-9 form, if that's the correct one, it will it runs through a series of checklists to determine if a person is a contractor or an employee, if there is a discussion or debut. And if there is a, if there is a question about whether a person is an employee or an employer, an IRS agent will come with the form and evaluate the job. That comes down to who furnishes the equipment, who makes the time, you know. Um, so a lot of these things does look like contractor. Who furnishes the equipment? Well, the driver does. It's his car. Who for sets the schedule? The driver does. He works when he wants to. Who sets the wage? Guess what? The company does. Because an employer, uh, an, an employer sets the wage of his employee. A contractor says, this is my wage. So since the people cannot dictate their wage, that's a mark in the employee column. Uh, next thing is, um, uh, the next thing, and this is one of the more important ones that is oftentimes overlooked. What is the critical functionality of it? That means that if Uber's business is to drive people back and forth, they have to have more employees than contractors driving the cars. If they don't, they would fall under those people would all fall under employees. Because if they look at it and say, well, we don't have a single person that works for us who actually drives. This is why Uber is not in like a taxi business. If you look at their qualification, they are a digital connection business. That's what, how they classify themselves. Because if they classify themselves as a taxi type service, they would absolutely fail that ruling. And so what happened is there was, uh, there was a lot of this and basically related to do they owe back taxes? Do they owe a lot of things? And by the way, if a business, if a business is falsely classifying people as contractors when they should be employees, the business is responsible to go back at least seven years and pay all of the back tax at once. It is a requirement. And so this is looked at as saying, well, this could be very possibly be devastating for Silicon Valley. You reap what you sow, man. You reap what you sow. And I'm not necessarily looking for all of this stuff to go out of business, but I am looking at that this helps the people who are driving. And frankly, these it doesn't mean Uber has to close down. It just means that the execs just got to tighten their belts a little bit. This is a good thing if they embrace it and a good thing. It's a good thing if they embrace it and say, we are going to look at this. And if a person's working more than certain hours, they're going to be called an employee. It means that they might have to, to maintain this level. They might have to bring on real legitimate employees of the company. These are all good things. These are good things. Um, but this is an interesting little article that is certainly worthy. Um, and of course, once it happens in California, it's just a matter of time before it dominoes everywhere else. Um, oh boy. Oh boy. I really wish I had got my fire screen up because I don't have it yet. I apologize. I don't have my fire screen up. This woman slipped and hit her head. Well, I don't know if it's this woman, but a woman slipped and hit her head. She clipped her ear on the way down, goes to the ER, refused treatment, and the ER decided that, well, we need to pay you anyway because we got your treatment ready. They sent her a bill for $5,751. Treatment, a Band-Aid, and an ice pack. A Band-Aid and an ice pack. $5,751. <laughs> Can we say corporatocracy? Because this is why our healthcare in this country is so screwed up. Maniacs are running the asylum. Psychopaths are running our country. I, I, I'm incredulous. Jessica Pell fainted, hit her head on a nearby table. 
cutting her ear. She went to the emergency room at Hoboken University Medical Center where she was given an ice pack. She received no other treatment. She, was still see, uh, she never received any diagnosis, but a bill arrived for $5,751. It's for the ice pack and the damn it and the bandage, Pell said of the fee. That is the only tangible thing they could bill me for. Pell's experience is not unique. Submissions to Vox's ER database project. Ooh, let's have a look at that site. Found multiple examples of ERs charging patients hundreds or even thousands of dollars for walking through the door. Some never got past the waiting room. Some were triage, but none received treatment from any doctor. Pell left the ER when she discovered the plastic surgeon who would see her was out of her network insurance. She decided to go to an in-network facility instead. She thought this was smart to avoid the costly fee that came with seeing the provider that wasn't included in her health plan. I decided to decline treatment because I can't really afford any surprise bills right now. <laughs> oh, until you get surprised, lady. <laughs> oh, the bill I'd probably incur would not be worth saving my ear, which was sad about a choice I had to make. Pell's insurance plan paid the hospital $862, which it deemed reasonable and appropriate fee for the services the hospital had paid. That left Pell with a $4,989 bill that she received on February 28th. Kitty is going crazy. Okay. All right. Okay, I guess maybe that is her. Uh, there's no way for me to have avoided this bill to have known that I would have been charged. Medical Center, where Pell was seen, declined to comment on the bill. The hospital did, according to Pell, reverse the entire balance after Vox began inquiring about the fees. Well, we cannot comment on rates for emergency room services. We are reaching out directly to the patient to work on a settlement resolution for her satisfaction. You know what resolution I would ask for? Never mind. There are kids watching this program. I'm not going to say what I was thinking about saying. High bills, but no treatment. His story is not unique. In the past six months, Vox has collected more than 1,000 emergency room bills submitted by readers in all 50 states and Washington, D.C. as part of an investigation into emergency room billing practices. The dominant storyline to emerge is that anyone who has visited an emergency room might expect treatment is expensive, but when health insurance plans don't pay, the patients are left with burdensome bills. Our database revealed another side of emergency room billing. Patients can face steep bills even when they didn't receive treatment. Multiple patients submitted bills to our database for ER visits where they declined treatment because they learned it would work, it would be out of network where uh, were frustrated with the wait time and began to feel better. They ended up with significant medical bills in the hundreds or even thousands of dollars. These fees were often on top of additional fees from another healthcare provider where they ultimately did receive treatment. Carolyn Wallace, for example, recently brought her four-year-old daughter Elizabeth to an emergency room in Texas. The young girl ran into a coffee table and cut her forehead above the eyebrow. Wallace first went to an emergency care clinic, which directed her to the emergency room at Memorial Hospital Southeastern in, in Houston. There, she and her daughter waited for about an hour. The only medical care she received at that time was a physician assistant taking her temperature. Wallace ultimately decided to seek and uh, leave and seek treatment at a different urgent care clinic where her daughter was seen quickly and received liquid stitches. The bill for the emergency room started coming around $300 from the hospital, an additional $669 from the physician's assistant who took her temperature. This felt it was an exorbitant fee and that was not at all the correlation to the service provided. Seemed really out of line with the situation. They didn't give me any new gauze or bandage or replace the paper towel we brought from home. They didn't give me anything to clean it with. Hospital reversed the $300 bill when she protested. The large doctor's bill came from a third-party physician staffing company called Team Health, which Wallace is attempting to protest as well. The spokesperson for Team Health did not return their request for comment. No kidding. These bills show the steep costs that medical rooms can charge just for walking through their doors. $300 fee was what she was charged in a typical facility fee, the price of entering the facility regardless of what happens afterwards. Hospital executives often argue these fees help them keep the lights and the doors open. Emergency rooms might come through their doors, anything from the sub toe to a stroke patient. But experts who study emergency room billing question how these facilities sets are charged, noting that they are seemingly arbitrary, widely vary from one hospital to another. Oh, God. Yeah. So 
Let's have a look at this emergency room costs. Eh, just a place to submit bills. All right. Oh, boy. What do you guys think? Have you received massive bills for simply walking into a hospital? Should these hospital executives be lynched? Maybe some tars and feathers might come to mind. This is ridiculous. It is exploitive. And it is dangerous for our society. Makes a lot of people not want to go to a doctor at all. What do you think? I hope you've enjoyed this video from Switched to Linux. If you'd like to help support the channel, check out the links at the top. There is another video over here. You can check out our Patreon page down here. And you can check out shop.switchtolinux.com for information on a t-shirt like this or some other designs. Thanks for watching and hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.